Hi Grade 7, welcome to Lesson 2 of our current topic and today we're going to be looking at adaptation. For today's starter task, watch this short video about adaptation from Fuse School. While you're watching it, listen to all the vocabulary. Do you recognise any of the terms used from your previous learning in science? So in today's lesson, we're going to continue looking at the relationships between different organisms in an environment. We'll do that and look at how living organisms are adapted to their habitat, relating these principles to a range of different organisms in the local and wider environment. We'll also need to understand the difference between an abiotic and a biotic factor and use examples of each. And then finally, we'll continue our understanding and investigation of the effect of changing environmental conditions on the number and distribution of organisms in a variety of habitats. The first thing we've got to be clear and understand, and it's a common misconception, is that an adaption can happen within an organism's lifetime. One single organism, one particular plant or animal, will not adapt and change to its environment in its lifetime. That's not what we're talking about here today. Instead, we're looking at the variation within a species and the organism that has the best features, the ones that are more advantageous to its survival, and those ones will survive. If they're the ones that survive and go on to reproduce, then they're the ones that are then going to continue and adapt. And over time, in many generations of that plant or animal, it will adapt to the best features and the best particular version of itself to be able to survive. This process of adaptation over many generations of a species was famously referred to as survival of the fittest by Charles Darwin. What you can see on the slide now is a simple illustration of the principle of survival of the fittest. We have an eagle and we have some snakes. At this point in time, in these generations, we have 50% of green snakes and 50% of the snakes are brown. Let's see what happens. The eagle can see the brown snakes very clearly against the grass, so those are the snakes that get eaten. If we then look at a subsequent generation, we now have 75% of the snakes are green, but only 25% of the snakes that are left are brown. These are the snakes that are left in order that are able to reproduce. If then more brown snakes continue to be eaten, we now have 0% brown snakes, and that means that only the green snakes are available to reproduce meaning that they are the fittest and that adaptation occurs and more of them will be green. Let's now look at the keywords. A word we've often used, environment, the surroundings and conditions an animal lives in. Survival means surviving and fighting to stay alive. Adaptation is the way that an animal has changed to become better able to survive in its environment. That also applies to plants. To camouflage is to hide or disguise yourself, to blend in with your surroundings, usually to keep yourself safe from being spotted by predators. Prey, we learned this in our last lesson, is an animal that's hunted or killed for food by another animal. Insulation is a layer of padding which keeps a person, an animal or a plant warm. In the humans and many animals, the insulation is in the form of fat, which is a layer of fat under your skin, which keeps your internal organs and the rest of your body at the temperatures required to survive. To minimise is to reduce something to its lowest level. A carnivore is an animal that eats meat and a herbivore is an animal which eats vegetables, only vegetables, uh, not meat at all. And an omnivore eats both meat and vegetables. Now, as we looked at in the learning outcomes, we've got two important new terms to learn today, abiotic and biotic. We'll start with the first, abiotic factors. Abiotic means a non-living environmental factor, like an external factor that can affect the organisms within an ecosystem. Some examples, common abiotic factors, are light intensity. So whether there's a great amount of sunshine or a very reduced type of sunshine, either due to weather or a canopy from a rainforest, the light intensity could vary. Soil moisture level means how dry or wet the soil is. Soil pH means how acidic or alkaline the soil is. And temperature is the temperature of the habitat that the animal is living in. The values of the abiotic factors in an ecosystem affect the variety of species that can be found. And this is because the individuals in each species are adapted to particular environmental conditions. 
Biotic factors are the opposite of abiotic factors. They're factors which are actual interactions associated with the living organisms themselves. Examples of those are things like food availability for the animal, competition for environmental resources, grazing, predation or disease. In today's lesson task, we're going to be considering four different animals which live in four very different environmental conditions. We'll be considering the rainforest, the desert, the mountain and the polar habitats. Key points about each of these are on the slide in front of you. A rainforest, which we have here in the green box, it will be hot and humid. That means a lot of moisture in the air. There'll be many predators, many leaves, and there will be a lot of competition between species for sunlight, water, food and nutrients. Looking at the desert environment, it's very hot and dry. There's a lot of competition for water because water is limited. It will be windy and typically have sandstorms. There might be long distances between food and water supplies, and it's extremely hot during the day, but very cold at night. So animals and plants need to adapt to be able to cope with that extreme change in the temperatures. In a mountainous environment, it's generally very cold temperatures at high altitudes. In addition to that, there is a reduced percentage of oxygen in the air at higher altitudes, which animals need to adapt to to be able to survive. Food can be quite difficult to catch. The rugged ground is often uneven and cold to walk on, and there are very few nutrients in the vegetation. The polar landscape is different again. Temperatures rarely go above freezing of zero degrees Celsius. A lot of the prey lives in the ocean rather than on the land. Very bright sunlight reflects off the snow and can make it very difficult to see. The icy ground is obviously very slippy and there can be this strong glare from the snow and the ice. On the worksheet, you will see that you have four different animals, one from each of the four environments we described. You're going to look at how they've adapted to their environment and then think of an explanation for each adaptation and why it helps them to survive in their natural environment. Let's have a look at the worksheet. So here are the four different animals that you're going to look at. You'll be looking at a camel, a camel living in a desert environment, and you want to think why each of these adaptations have occurred and what their purpose is. In the second table, you have a polar bear to look at, living in the polar region. In the snow leopard, you're looking at the mountainous region. And then finally, the spider monkey, you're looking at the rainforest region and deciding why they have each of these adaptations. If you manage to complete all that within our lesson time, your extra challenge today is to try and suggest one more adaptation for each of the four animals we've looked at to make them even better suited to their environment. And let's now share the ideas that you came up with, both for the adaptations that were listed and any additional ones that you came up with for the extra challenge task. To finish off today's lesson, I'd like you to try this quiz. Can you think of one adaptation to meet each of these different conditions? A very hot climate, a very cold climate, lots of predators nearby, very little water nearby and little oxygen in the atmosphere. For our extra learning today, as we looked at in the last lesson, I'd like you to use the gizmo to look in more detail about changes to a food web and how alterations in the numbers of each species can affect the overall proportion of the other animals in a chain, the knock-on effects from an increase or a decrease in one of the populations. Remember, my video was on there for you to look through in your own pace to explain how to use that resource. And now that we've done a bit more work understanding habitats, feeding relationships and the impact on changes in organisms to other organisms in the environment, I'd like you to have another go at the Feed the Dingo game. You should be getting better at this and able to make changes which will cause positive impact on other species within your environment. At the end of lesson two today, we should now have a really good understanding of how living organisms are adapted to their habitat and also understand how changes in different living organisms impact on the relationships between them and other organisms within their habitat. We should know our definitions for abiotic and biotic factors, so look back over those if you're not sure. And we should also be able to make predictions and changes to environmental conditions and see what happens to the distribution of organisms within a variety of habitats.